Thank you for coming and welcome. We are doubly delighted today to have with us Esther Allen and Jose Manuel Prieto. Jose Manuel Prieto is a novelist and a scholar. He was born in Havana, earned his PhD in history in Mexico at the Universidad Autónoma de Mexico. Spent about 12 years living in Russia, yeah, something like that, in uh, Novosibirsk, and eventually settled in New York City, where he's lived since 2004. He's an associate professor at Seton Hall University. He's been a visiting professor or distinguished lecturer, among other places, at Cornell and Princeton. He's also been a Guggenheim Fellowship recipient and a fellow at the New York Public Library Center for Scholars and Writers. Jose Prieto has published several works of fiction and nonfiction, including the trilogy whose first novel we'll be talking about today, Encyclopedia de una Vida en Rusia, Encyclopedia of a Life in Russia. Together with the other two novels in that trilogy, Livadia, translated as Nocturnal Butterflies of the Russian Empire, and Rex, um, this book combines, I'm not going to try to characterize it, I don't know, um, Borgesian curiosity and Nabokovian gamesmanship and um, an eye to the aesthetic underpinnings of the collapse of the Soviet aesthetic system and the Soviet empire. Um, he also has a book of short stories, Tartamudo e la Rusa, and his new novel, Voz Humana, or Human Voice, is forthcoming. Um, also, to reverse for our purposes the usual cliche at such events, um, Jose Manuel Prieto is also a distinguished translator in his own right. Usually you say that somebody's also a distinguished poet in his own right. <laughs> um, among other things, he's translated into Spanish poetry by Anna Akhmatova, Vladimir Mayakovsky, Gennady Aigi, and Osip Mandelstam, and prose by Andrei Draconov. Um, and his polyglot background enlivens and complicates every page. And just before I introduce you, Esther, I'm going to uh, give people an example of um, the linguistic prestidigitation, not to say, I don't know, alchemy, uh, that you had to engage in here. I'm just going to read one paragraph. Uh, this book is organized as an encyclopedia, as you'll hear, within, with alphabetical entries. Um, I'm going to read a short paragraph from close to the beginning of the novel called Bogatik, um, glossed as Mythic Warrior. We might ha call him a colossus out of a medieval epic poem of heroic deeds. He represents the Nimedina, incomparable force of the Russian nation. Many secretly know themselves to be Bogati, a conviction for which no evidence whatsoever is required. One need only sprawl next to the wood stove, drink kvass, be large-bellied and wide-shouldered, and remain imperturbably in that reclining position until the fateful day arrives, the day when little Mother Russia is in need. In everyday life, the term has been put to unfortunate use as the name of a chain of shops that deal in plus-size menswear. <laughs> this is the kind of work we're talking about here. Um, Esther Allen teaches at Baruch College at CUNY and is co-chair of a seminar in the humanities called Transculturation at the CUNY Graduate Center. Professor Allen is also an exciting scholar of translation studies, and she's co-editor with Susan Bernowski of a book that... Um, Rosanna Warren says is going to shake the foundations <laughs> of the field of translation studies, so we're really looking forward to it. Uh, it's coming out in May from Columbia, and it's called In Translation, Translators on Their Work and What It Means. She has translated a number of works from Spanish and French, including the Penguin Classics Anthology, José Martí, Selected Writings. In 2006, the French Ministry of Culture and Communication named her Chevalier, Chevalier? Uh, Delors des Arts et des Lettres for her work promoting a culture of translation in the United States. In 2009, she was a fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. We're also really lucky to have with us today as a special bonus, uh, Pavel Brushko, who is uh, the translator of various people, including Neruda, um, into Russian and who has translated uh, Jose into Russian. And I hope he will participate actively in the discussion hour, we're going to try for um, a format that's a little presentation at first, and then we'll take a break around the middle to let people who need to teach it to run away, and then come back for a hands-on um, discussion Q and A. Oh, please, what time is it right now? I don't have a watch. I, don't have a watch or I do. Yeah. I do want my watch. Yeah. So yes, 
So let us track. appropriately welcome <laughs> Mr. Allen <laughs> and Jose. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming, and um, uh, I was I'm very glad to, um, to be here, and uh, for, uh, thank you for the invitation for uh, to to this uh, event. I'm also very happy to with with my uh, with Esther Allen, um, who we are good friends, and um, also for her fantastic job she did with the translation of this book. I'm also very happy with, to, uh, to, uh, to have um, Pavel, uh, we met recently in Moscow. So we are going to, uh, I was, we spoke with Esther about how we were going to, to do this, and I'm going to, we are going to, to start reading, I'm going to start reading, uh, we are going to start reading from, from, the, from the novel. I'm going to start in, in Spanish a little bit, and Esther, the translation. And then, um, and then she's going to read um, a very interesting. I was reading in the in the, in the train in the way to to Boston. Um, so this is a novel I wrote when I was uh, still in Moscow in Saint Petersburg, uh, like uh, in 1993. And um, it came out in in Mexico. When that, after that, I moved to Mexico, and uh, I. Um, it was published in Mexico. This is the, the Mexican edition. There is another edition uh, that, that came out in Spain. But th this is the one I love the most you know, because it's, I, I, you know, contributed to the cover and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this was, uh, in, in, um, so I'm starting to, how, uh, this is an encyclopedia. This, it's organized by, in alphabet, uh, alphabet uh, order with different entries. So it's, it was, it's, um, it's, um, it's a novel still, and this is this is something that it, it, I organized. I have have uh, have this had this idea when I started to write a novel. I had this idea of, of writing like a simple novel about uh, something is happening in Mos in Saint Petersburg, and uh, something's coming. And then I realized that uh, I have to provide a context for for a reader who is not familiar with the Russian reality. So I started to write some some kind of like footnotes and. Uh, even providing this context, and then they realized that this is um, a, a narrative and a novel by itself. Uh, so there are entries in the novel that, uh, with the plot, is um, with, the, with something this, the the narrative hap is happening, is going on. But there are all others that are yours um, at um, essay of different uh, aspect of the Russian life. Uh, so I'm starting to um, the first one. I'm in. In fact, you were going to read the abacus. We'll start with the abacus. Yes, please. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll both read in alphabetical order. I'll read some entries. Um, uh, I'll read a few, and then Jose will read a few, and we'll go back and forth. Yeah. Um, so the uh, we'll we'll start with abacus. Abacus. The satisfaction of embarking upon this encyclopedia with an entry that figures on the first page of so many. We find the abacus throughout Russia, fabricated of metal, wood, and bone, displayed on many a counter as a guarantee of impartial computation, yet serving primarily as a means of swindling the buyer, who never quite manages to grasp, who follows the play of beads along wires, hypnotized. Having consulted the complex framework of the abacus, golden-haired oracles announce impenetrable results, weighted in their favor by at least 10%. I've known shrewd customers to carry a pocket abacus for rapid verification. I often ask Kay to teach me how to use one, an art she's known from the time she was a girl, but I never managed to get past the hundreds column to the final wire. ¿Y tú qué ibas a leer? El lacha. Okay, lacha. Bueno, yo tengo a Collapse of the Imperium. Sí. Leo eso y después lacha. Okay. We're going to read in alphabetical order. Um... So, if it were, yeah. Um, so, collapse of the Imperium. This is a key, a key entry, as you can all imagine. As a uniquely privileged witness, the manservant hidden in the stables who recognizes the trembling emperor despite the matronly cosmetics used to disguise his face and watches him saddle the thoroughbred for his flight. I, who came from territories beyond the sea, watched the beggars proliferating in the metro stations and discovered my heart in my throat 
purple graffiti that denounced the cruelty of the Imperium, all the spilled Russian blood. I saw my own years of savings devoured by runaway inflation. I dined for three dinars one evening and breakfasted the next morning for a thousand. I learned to live without the security, the hope, the center of the universe that was the doctrine. And every day awoke with a smaller portion of soul, seeing more clearly, yes, but diminished ever further by the awareness of my error, the years gone by in vain, all that I had wagered on a false emperor. I was attacked in my own home by men sent from the Sassanid Empire in search of gold. I leapt into the void with my hands bound like a Hindu prince escaping from his Alcazar as it crashes down in flames around him, then fleeing at full gallop, hugging the neck of his steed. And my despair was such that I was tempted to traffic in weapons for the Imperium's southern wars, and I dealt in the electron, the yellow stone, provided to me by two blonde and insolent merchants from the Baltic. I watched the Imperium fall, saw its soul depart from its body through a thousand tiny cracks, saw that immense, enraged, and fearsome body emit wheezes of impotence until it collapsed, inert, abhorred, a shapeless sprawl on the ground, the occasion for photographs taken by tourists playing the triumphal hunter, one foot on the bear's prone mass, fingers in a V. Yes. Y ahora la hacha. Sí, el que voy a leer es, se llama hacha, es uno de los tópicos que están en la, en la enciclopedia. Dice, los frondosos bosques de Moscovia, aldeas y monasterios retrepados en perspectiva vertical, monjes que penetran la floresta enhebrando el primer reino moscovita a golpes de segures y bisyedina baguasdea sin un solo clavo acostumbramos a ver el hacha como un instrumento de leñadores en Rusia, sin embargo siempre hay una a menos de 5 metros de radio al alcance de la mano tan comunes como cuchillos para el pan el hacha representa la brutalidad el lado ni aptioso ni sin, o sin devastar del alma rusa Raskolnikov mata a la usurera y a Elizabeth con un hacha. Sabemos por Gogol que durante las heladas los tontos de aldea dejaban jirones de lengua en el metal frío. Podrá parecernos incómoda y de hecho lo es, pero el ruso bueno que ha decidido llegar hasta las últimas consecuencias blande una y golpea seguro sin temor a la efusión de sangre. El hacha representa, como señalamos más arriba, lo irracional, el miedo cerval, a a a Anasmato lo sentía perfectamente. Y aquí cito un problema de una, unos, unos versos. Estrach, Watnie Privaraya Vieche, Lumni Lush, Navodet Natapor. Y es que dice: Miedo, removiendo cosas en mi cuarto oscuras, un rayo de luna rompe en el filo de un hacha. Ese es uno de los. Um, de los um, y les voy a leer ahora otro que se llama El de Noches Blancas, que está en la página 112. Noches Blancas hace esa alusión a la famosa noveleta de Dostoyevsky, ¿verdad? Que es esta famosa, um, que pasa en, las, en ese momento, en ese momento en June, en Rush, en San Petersburg, cuando you have the, 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 the sky is this bright in, at 11 in the night, in, in, the, in the afternoon. So, this is it's called Noches Blancas. Ahora ya puedo revelarles el secreto, el golpe de bombín y conejo de las noches blancas, el tenue resplandor de una luna y un sol equinoxiales. Había elegido expresamente la fecha, aguardado la conjunción favorable de los astros, y aunque había tenido el cuidado de no mencionar en qué mes nos encontrábamos, el lector conocedor de la obra de Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoyevsky debía suponer que no desaprovecharía el, de, el decorado fantasmagórico de las noches blancas, la descripción de un largo paseo por la ciudad insomne. Linda y yo salimos de la historia tomados del brazo. A la escasa luz de aquella hora se rebajaron los colores del vestido, el carmín de sus labios. Yo avanzaba pisando muy despacio, luchando contra algo que sentía a punto de derramarse dentro de mí, rebosar la cavidad craneana. Cuando alcanzamos el Katerinsky Canal, Linda se acodó al, mudo, al muro y observó absorta el correr del agua. Al rato pareció haber dado con las palabras que buscaba desde hacía media hora, desde antes de la lengua de Marif. Y esa le pongo en ruso. Znaš, ni nuši mi tu eraman. Ya da se nadkazadza, ya pili dumala. Marif, kanishna prav. 
Me estremecí como alcanzado por un rayo. Aquella tirada en su más puro ruso. Sabes, he cambiado de idea. Me niego a continuar con tu plan. Marif tiene razón. Linda no me dio tiempo a reponerme, a intentar una maniobra. Prosiguió. No alcanzo a descubrir en tu plan algo que realmente merezca un movimiento de mi alma, un esfuerzo de mi espíritu. Jamás llegaré a considerar las modas, el buen vestir, todo lo que mencionaste esta tarde en el jardín, como cosas capaces de cambiar mi vida, de quitarme el sueño. Dios, si comprendo perfectamente que cuentas con mi juventud, y con mi dinero, linda, y con tu dinero, Joseph, pero lo crees suficiente, deberás cambiarme totalmente, volverme otra, y estoy segura de que no lo lograrás. Para nosotros no es vergonzoso ser pobre, al contrario, el pecado está en la riqueza. No imaginas cuán, ajena, <coughs> cuán ajeno es al alma rusa el fasto, la riqueza. Al oírles decir esto, respiré aliviado. Había cometido un error. Quise ensanchar la brecha. No, ustedes son esencialmente iguales, solo que lo han olvidado. En 1915, la Jalotnaya, que es una actriz de cine rusa de la época muda, vendió más pósters que, foto, que fotos la familia imperial. Algo perfectamente comprensible, creo. Solo pretendo enseñarte a odiar algunas cosas como esos aborrecibles cuadros de Dalí que has elogiado hoy. Y el ridículo gabán cosaco de Marif. ¿No te da risa? ¿No lo consideras tú también una bufonada? Pero, ¿cómo puedes pretender conocer Rusia? Tú, un extranjero, jamás lo lograrás. Somos muy distintos. Pensarás que exagero, pero siento que Occidente ha perdido toda su santidad. Sí, santidad es la palabra justa. Mira, no alcanzo a ver claramente dónde se esconde el fallo, pero percibo en todo esto cierta nota falsa que sinceramente no encuentro en la vida que vamos en Rusia. Quizás algún día lleguemos a occidentalizarnos, pero sin transformarnos internamente. Además, me has dicho que te, ocupas, que te, ocup, que te ocupa lo intrascendente, pero no pretendes trascender con tu novela y ese título, la palabra alma que en él figura. Descubro, y disculpa que te lo diga, una profunda contradicción entre lo que propugnas y tu plan. No te diría mejor la, la inconsciencia a qué ese afán de fijar este verano. Um, so, we're a little out of alphabetical order, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, we're going to go back to expectoration. It's one of my favorite chapters. <laughs> expectoration or spitting. Um, the Muscovites are exceedingly adept expectorators. They constantly announce, I spit on this and, and on that. Jose, ¿lo puedes decir? <laughs> My Russian is non-existent. Um, and, at the, <laughs> and at the appropriate point in the diatribe, emit a ptui of profound disdain that he is the impeccable acoustic counterpart of spitting. Despite what might generally be supposed, this pantomime is not frowned upon. Everyone does it, and it is quite theatrical. But a real expectoration so innocent a thing, a simple gob of saliva on the lawn, sends them into near hysterics, first because of the lawn, they are great lovers of verdure, and then because it's so very ugly. And the false but sonorous ptri is not? What do you make of this, K? And of the way they crack sunflower seeds in public and toss the shells on the ground. <laughs> So, and then, and then a very short entry. This obviously had to be here. Kvass. Russia is an old country with strange fermented beverages and barrel staves lying in the mud. I jump from stave to stave to keep my boots from getting dirty while dogs bark behind fences. At the corner, this city on the Volga where I've come to spend a few weeks, these low brick buildings... The same woman as yesterday is pouring out kvass. <risa> bueno, yo voy a leer otro, unos, uno más breve. Y este es un, sobre el, uh, un tipo de perfume que, que estaba de moda en los 90, se llama Opium. No me acuerdo quién era. Dice, el Volga inmenso y sus afluentes, la gruesa arena de sus playas, los maleconcitos con sus canteros sin flores y glorietas para la banda musical de los domingos. Era a cualquier capital europea lo que las fragancias de la primavera, el hollín de los vapores fluviales, los olores naturales de un cuerpo sano y limpio pero humano, eran al opio, el perfume que Yves Saint Laurent había lanzado aquel año. El día había sido cálido, 
y al caer la noche bajé a la ciudad con la intención de ver algún filme de estreno. Tomé asiento en la última fila de un cine casi vacío, hora y media en la que atravieso el alma en vilo los anillos de polvo cósmico que rodean el misterio inexplicable del crimen, su masa giratoria y flotante. Pende en el espacio, no sabemos qué fuerza lo sostienen, pero está allí, podemos tocarle. Y al hacerlo, tiemblo de pies a cabeza. Han transcurrido muchos veranos desde aquel entonces. Hoy creo haber perdido esa capacidad, pero aquel año había estado leyendo sin descanso durante meses y me había ajustado para reaccionar a los más leves estímulos. Un bajísimo umbral de respuesta. Podía entrar fácilmente en resonancia, estremecerme hasta las lágrimas con una historia de lealtad. El héroe que pasaba los años regresa y mata, limpia la conciencia. Y yo estaba tan necesitado de esencias puras, de ideas no contaminadas por nociones de utilidad, de, verdad, de verdades en abstracto. A mitad del firme, alguien comenzó a vibrar a pocos metros de mí. El calor de la primavera, tal vez la emoción similar. Los envíos de un excelente perfume, francés sin duda alguna. Había tardado media hora en alcanzar mis fosas nasales, o era que el misterio descubierto, la emoción singular me había abierto un canal más. La imaginé morena porque era un perfume oscuro y denso. Por un segundo valoré la posibilidad de intentar un acercamiento a la salida del cine, pero como estábamos en Moscovia, corrí el peligro de descubrir una mujer de pelo laxo y claro, perfumada con aquella esencia para mujeres morenas. Un detalle aparentemente insignificante, pero que podía desajustar toda aquella experiencia. Yo había aprendido a recogerme, a no multiplicar las esencias, y me fui directo a casa. Um, ¿Y no quieres leer también este? Porque lo, lo, lo mío cónicas. es el último. Ok, voy a leer las cónicas. ¿Dónde está? ¿En qué página? La 147. Exacto. Sí, este se llama Raskolnikov S.A. Dice... Bueno, es un poco largo. Well, sí, exacto. <risa> San Petersburgo seguía siendo una buena ciudad en lo concerniente a patios ciegos, escaleras oscuras, llovizna pertinaz, inundaciones y usureras, o ancianas que parecían serlo. Encorvadas, se arrastraban por las aceras sin árboles, internándose en saguanes, cobrando intereses. Yo sabía que eran mujeres sobrevivientes de los 900 días del bloqueo, pero al verlas pasar, pensaba en Elizabeth, la boba, en el dinero y en las reliquias que quizá conservaban envueltas en sucios pañuelos de percal. A veces registraban el deambular de alguna, a veces registraba el deambular de alguna siguiéndola a corta distancia. De pronto, su fino oído de octogenaria captaba el chas de mis zapatos contra el agua de un charco, y se volvía y como en su lejana juventud también había leído a Dostoyevsky, estudiaba detenidamente los faldones de mi sobre todo, y su mirada se era seca, porque estaba dispuesta a enfrentar el hachazo con toda entereza. En realidad eran ancianas muy pobres, pero conservaban descoloridos servicios de té o algún abrigo de bisón comido por las polillas, y vivían temiendo un atraco. Pero San Petersburgo seguía siendo una buena ciudad en lo tocante a verdaderos suceros y anticuarios con colecciones de elevado valor. Entre las fuentes de esta enciclopedia, guardo un suelto sobre la muerte violenta de un coleccionista de antigüedades y su anciana sirvienta. Me sedujo precisamente el esquema, el viejo amante de las bronces chinos y la sirvienta, y los ladrones que le dan muerte. Habían para, band para varias bandas de ladrones. La colección estaba estimada en casi un billón de rublos, o varios miles de millones de rublos, o varios millones de dólares, quizás decenas, una enorme cantidad de dinero, como para montar en vivo la guerra y la paz con el príncipe André herido contemplando el cielo y Bonaparte pasándole revista a las tropas en Austerlitz. El viejito había juntado la valiosa colección en años de intenso contrabandear y había terminado poseyendo los millones de rublos, podría organizar un ciclo de conferencias, cómo llegar al millón, y tendría asegurado un lleno total. Eran millones en bronces chinos y antigüedades, y debajo de las tortugas con jeroglifos en el carapacho, las ballenas de San Petersburgo crepuscular, y sobre las tortugas los elefantes de la, usura de la usura elemental, del cambio de divisas, y coronando el tinglado, él y a su lado, los ladrones dispuestos a empujarlo al abismo, a chapotear con las ballenas. El reportero informaba que el hombre había iniciado su colección con varios contenedores sustraídos ilegalmente de la República Popular China, a donde había viajado en los años 50 a construir una hidroeléctrica. Varios contenedores, indudablemente algo muy siglo XX. Aquellos eran cálculos serios, 
reveladores del carácter de toda una época. Han muerto 70 o 70, 60 o 70 millones de rusos en lo que va de siglo, no de muerte natural, guerra, hambres y archipiélago. Esto introduce un cambio mental. El hombre, el difunto coleccionista, se encuentra en China y China resulta ser un país muy grande y él piensa en contenedores. Y los racónicos que planean el golpe piensan también en millones, pero no en tantos. Esto de haberle tomado de sorpresa. Cargan con antigüedades por varios millones de rublos y abandonan el apartamento. Cuando el crimen es descubierto y los peritos se mueven cautelosos por los pasillos, todavía repletos de marfil y bronce, siguen desapareciendo millones. La milicia procede a sellar el apartamento, pero a la mañana siguiente encuentran los sellos saltados y que faltan varios millones de rublos más. Habrían hecho falta cuatro bandas de rascónicos para desvalijar aquella cueva y cuatro dostoyevskis para escribir las colillas encendidas. Lo torturaron, pero no reveló el escondite del efectivo y los muchos hachazos para ambos. Eran demasiados millones y es San Petersburgo porque el articulista no menciona un sistema de alarma electrónica, ni un guardaespaldas que cuidase la del señor anticuario, ni un seguro contraataco, a un tratraco. Solo describen el precario apartamento, la llamada a la puerta y un simple ojeada al visor, la carita de la anciana sirvienta en el visor sin el marco trabajado en oro de los zampones que la seguían. Ven, espero más credulidad para todo lo que les cuente. San Petersburgo era la ciudad apropiada para llevar adelante mis planes. Yo había alquilado una suite apartamento en el Astoria por 550 dólares en la noche y quise, que, y quise ver el apartamento que Fyodor Mihailovich había rentado no lejos de allí. No sé por qué suma. Es el fin de la, de, de la, de la. Um, so I'm going to read the first paragraph of an entry that in Jose's book that he's holding is called Vida Secreta de las Plantas. Mm. Um, I, I think you, everyone has the handout, which is a little bit about the kind of superficial challenges of translating a book that's in alphabetical order. Um, and this was one of the nicest, uh, the, the nicest little solutions because Vida Secreta de las Plantas is secret life of plants, um, which uh, comes well before in the alphabet S comes before V, well before, and in the order of the book, that would really, this is a kind of final chapter, it, it's kind of elegiac about all that goes before, so it really couldn't move ahead, and um, very fortunately, The Secret Life of Plants is the name of an album by Stevie Wonder, so in in this book, it's called Wonder, Stevie, colon, The Secret Life of Plants. <laughs> If Stevie Wonder was named Stevie Carson, this recourse would not have had any, we wouldn't have been able to do this, but of course, Stevie Wonder never could have been named Stevie Carson, that would be impossible. He had to be Stevie Wonder, so it was, we were saved by the fact that the musician's last name is Wonder. Um, and there's no Stevie Wonder in, in Jose's book. You just have to figure out that it's an allusion to Stevie Wonder. But we made the allusion explicit in order to preserve the alphabetical order. Um, so this is the first paragraph of Wonder Stevie, The Secret Life of Plants. Uh, through my capillaries ran the sap of a hundred thousand melodies, green globules that sometimes pass through the alkaline barrier of the cell walls and burst forth upon my lips in the form of song. Many of these particle songs had names that were incapable today of reactivating the nervous centers of those intense sessions of listening. Boogie shoes, the secret life of plants. Now more or less forgotten, but that during my adolescence had been the key to deciphering the messages of truth we received from the world's radio broadcast centers. At night, immobile in the penumbra of my room, I twirled the receiver's dial tirelessly until the galvanic discharge of that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, uh-huh, uh-huh. I wanted to be able to do that in public. That's why I read the <laughs> <laughs> Came, I don't know how good I did, how well I did, but you'll forgive me. Um, came pouring through, and I would shake my leg like a frog in an experiment, kicking out reflexively in response to the electric shock, and raise my head, eyes full of life. I should have explained all this to Linda. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to say um, I prepared some remarks, and then I'll... I'll talk, and then Jose will talk, and then after that we can have questions. Um, but because I have the privilege of sitting here with Jose next to me, it seemed like an excellent moment to talk about authorial intention and translation. <laughs> <laughs> so um, earlier this month, I was invited to be on a panel about translation at a Brooklyn bookstore. 
the announcement promised potential audience members that they would find out what it takes to make sure the meaning of the words that have moved us to laugh, cry, and learn new things are delivered the way the author intended. Okay, that was the description. Or written earlier this month in Brooklyn. In the end, the recent blizzard made the event impossible. But even in the, I'm sure you all remember the blizzard. <laughs> no one's forgotten that yet. Um, but even in the absence of heavy snowfall, I would have found it impossible to explain how to translate words the way the author intended. For, and note that I say this in the presence of the author himself and have chosen to talk about authorial intent precisely because he's here and can talk back to me, um, making sure to convey an author's intentions is not something a translation, any translation, can do. Authors themselves can tell you that more often than not, whatever it was that they intended when they wrote something was ignored by readers or forgotten and replaced by a different and shifting set of intentions even in their own minds once the piece was published or in the years following its composition. Monica de la Torre has a lovely article titled Unreliable Self-Translation, which is in a recent issue of the Translation Review, number 81, which describes how difficult it is for the author herself to divine the author's intentions when she switches into the role of translator. In the case we're discussing here, many of the most prominent features of José Manuel Prieto's work the extensive use of citations and intertextual references, the recurrent theme of literary production as mashup, remix, and commentary, the use of constraints such as the encyclopedia format of this novel that we're here to discuss today, seem well intended to mount a direct challenge to the idea that a book consists merely of what its author intended. Words derive much of their meaning from their context, as Prieto superbly demonstrates in the essay on Mandelstam's epigram against Stalin that we circulated in anticipation of today's conversation. And the intentions of those who enunciate them form only a small part of that context, particularly as the moment of enunciation recedes into the past. Prieto himself is a translator, and his work is informed by a strong sense of the ambiguous and perennially shifting nature of semantic meaning. But not every writer has that sense. A dispute flared up last year between the playwright Edward Albi and his Catalan translator, Juan Selent, after Albi demanded that Selent account in a five-column grid for any deviation from the exact English words and the explanation why this couldn't be translated into Spanish, sick, and why the words that were chosen were used. For more info on this spat, I refer all of you to the marvelous blog Translationista, where Susan Bernowski catalogs and comments on the translation news of the moment. And I, Selen's reply to Albi definitely is worth uh, taking the time to read. Um, as I pondered the most challenging problems I confronted when translating Encyclopedia of a Life in Russia, the intentions of the author with whom I was in frequent discussion were only part of a continuum of factors influencing my choices, factors that also included the internal logic of the text itself, which is something distinct from an author's intentions, the transformations wrought upon that logic by the, trans by the process of translation into another language, the nearly two decades that have elapsed between the book's original composition, uh, Jose began writing it in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it was, uh, um, and it was first published in 1988, and my translation of it, with all the historical, technological, and political transformations those two decades have wrought, and my own personal sense of the literary, political, and overall cultural context I was translating the text into, and which of its features might speak most strongly to that audience, connect most strongly with that audience. The particular feature of the encyclopedia I've chosen to discuss today is its polyglossia. I use the term in homage to the great Russian literary historian and theoretician Mikhail Bakhtin, whose work the discipline of translation studies would do well to rediscover. Bakhtin associates what he calls polyglossia with parody, as well as with texts that incorporate multiple languages. Polyglossia is the opposite of what Bakhtin calls a sealed off and impermeable monoglossia. Only polyglossia, he writes, fully frees consciousness from the tyranny of its own language and its own myth of language. 
Prieto's Enciclopedia de una Vida en Rusia, first published in Mexico in 1998 and then in Spanish in two, in the, by the Spanish publisher Mondadori in 2004, exhibits a marked degree of polyglossia. The headwords of its 77 entries are in Spanish, Russian, English, Latin, and German, all transliterated into the Latin alphabet. The novel includes citations of Spanish translations of texts originally written in all of those languages and in Hebrew, French, and Japanese as well. In this novel, and to a greater degree than most other contemporary literary texts that I can think of, with the exception of Vasilis Alexakis' Marvelous Foreign Words, which I recommend to all of you if you haven't read it, um, the extent to which the language in which one chooses to speak is a central component of the meaning of what one says is illustrated again and again. When the narrator first addresses the book's heroine in a St. Petersburg park, the concision of her reply to his query makes him think that she is ya pensando también en inglés, already thinking, too, in English. Towards the end of the book, when she tells him in English, well, I'm going to New York, Joseph, he begs her to speak Russian and not to go to New York. Elsewhere, Russian housewives are infuriated by the sound of the narrator conversing in a language that is not Russian as he passes by in the street. And the fact of mastery or non-mastery of the Russian language is a continuing theme. In one of my favorite moments, the narrator is watching a video that has no sound because the person who recorded it may have neglected to engage the sound button. In the entry that, in my translation as well, appears under the headword pasarela, the narrator comments, my lips pronounced a single word three or four times, a word that when I first watched the video, I couldn't decipher until it dawned on me that I was speaking in Russian. Then I understood. Orosho? Orosho. 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 Good. Perfect. The encyclopedia is a text that insistently reminds us of something so obvious we very often forget it. One of the primary and most significant semantic components of any utterance is the selection of the language in which it is uttered. The heroine's selection of English for her reply to the narrator's first advance says much about who she is and what her ambitions are, just as the fluent mastery of Russian, the Spanish-speaking narrator boasts of in the volume's first entry, tells us a great deal about him. And therein lay the first challenge of my translation, to render into English a text that explicitly rejects its character's use of English, to take out of Spanish a text about Russia that is of particular interest for the very fact of its having been written in Spanish, is inevitably to depart in a dramatic way from the intentions that lay behind the original 1998 book. A strong feature of the 1998 encyclopedia is the paucity of allusion to the Spanish-speaking world and to literature written in Spanish. The narrator's tropical home country is barely mentioned, and in the book's dense tissue of literary reference, only two have any explicitly Hispanic component, an allusion to Borges and the citation of a guaracha that compares a sexy girl to a sea siren. In interviews and articles, Prieto has often stated that Russian literature has had more of an influence on his work than Latin American literature, and he describes his first three novels as his Russian trilogy, as you've already heard. For the reader of the original text, the book's origin in the Spanish-speaking world is evident in its every word and requires no further emphasis. As its translator into English, my overwhelming primary allegiance was to the Spanish language. If readers of the English translation were allowed to forget that the book was first written in Spanish, not Russian or English, and that it was translated from Spanish, not Russian, the book risked being denatured, stripped of all the historic and cultural meaning that derives from the specific language in which it was first written. The translation therefore explicitly sought to emphasize the Spanishness of this text about Russia, but in a way that did not undermine the original text's will to leave its Latin American origins in deep background. Uh, keeping certain words or phrases in the source language, always an option, here became an imperative, and the English retains as much Spanish as I felt was possible. No longer the language of the text itself, Spanish becomes a key element in its polyglossia. Another feature of the text that is present but kept very much in the background in the original is its meditation on translation. The 1998 Encyclopedia concludes with the following line. 
lleno de vida hoy, compacto, visible, Whitman. Lleno de vida hoy, compacto, visible, yo. The repetition already indicates that this is a translation of a sort. In the first iteration, it is a line by Whitman. In the second, the line is claimed by the narrator, recontextualized into his own life experience. The fact that both iterations are in Spanish disguises the element of translation. A translator into Chinese or Russian could do the same, repeating the line twice in its Chinese or Russian version. But the translator into Whitman's own language doesn't have that option. What was more, this was a chance to conclude the novel with a final reminder of its Spanishness by offering the narrator's Spanish version of Whitman as a translation. Full of life now, compact, visible, Whitman. Lleno de vida hoy, compacto, visible, me. This solution struck me as perfect but entrained a whole set of consequences. If the imperative of alphabetical order and the need to re-emphasize the original language was requiring me to position a source text alongside its translation, here and in many of the head words such as pasarela, which in my translation is followed by the English catwalk in parentheses. That one I couldn't solve. I just had to use the Spanish. The tacit theme of translation, which those solutions made explicit, had to become more explicit throughout. By positioning the source text of all the encyclopedia's myriad citations alongside their translation into English. For if this had to be done with translations between English and Spanish, one of the less important language pairings within the polyglossy of this text, then it had to be done with all the other languages as well. When I first discussed this option with Jose, he, he resisted it, and with good reason. He worried that marking the text polyglossia so strongly, including citations in seven different languages, would alienate potential Anglophone readers, striking them as off-puttingly pretentious or academic. He was also laudably concerned that the incorporation of so many languages would appear to constitute a claim to fluency in all of them, a claim that neither he nor I could honestly make. He didn't want to seem like a fraud. The first of his objections would quite likely have been valid if this translation had been published at the same time or within a year or two of the original 1998 text. However, my sense is that over the course of the past two decades, and especially in the past five years, multilingualism has acquired a marked cachet in the Anglophone urban literary sphere that is likely to take an interest in this kind of novel. For examples, I'll point out the increased use of foreign language dialogue with subtitles in Hollywood blockbuster films, of which the recent films by Quentin Tarantino that include the Austrian actor Christoph Waltz are an instance. I'll, I could name others, but that's the only one I'll name. The rise of a foodie culture with its highly polyglot vocabulary, the increased popularity of yoga with its constant use of Sanskrit, the surging success of web-based language learning sites such as Rosetta Stone, Live Mocha, Babbel. For those readers of the encyclopedia with some understanding of one or more of its source languages, their incorporation into the translation could only enhance the experience of the novel. And for those who understand only the English, the visible presence of those alien words on the page would constitute a kind of pictorial illustration of the confrontation with a foreign system of meaning that is the book's fundamental subject matter. To enhance this sense of foreign language as illustration, I wanted to include as little transliteration as possible, but use original scripts for all source texts. This meant, first and foremost, offering Russian words and passages in Cyrillic, and including translation only when the word's sound value could add some dimension of meaning or rhythm to the visual impact of the Cyrillic letters. I quickly realized there was an additional feature of the text that motivated my sense that this was necessary. The encyclopedia includes many reflections on recent innovations in printing technology, recent in the mid-90s such as the scanner, the ebook, and advances in word processing that were eliminating the distinction between manuscript and published text. In the two decades following that first publication, those advances have made it as easy to include the Cyrillic alphabet in a publication as it is to change a text font on a computer screen. Low-tech, old-fashioned transliteration would have belied the novel's own claim to expertise in the cutting edge of printing technology. This left me with a big headache, 
For the logic that dict dictated the inclusion of the Cyrillic, which Jose could supply, dictated the inclusion of the original Japanese and Hebrew scripts as well. And that was a more daunting challenge in which fortunately several friends who speak those languages very generously came to my assistance. I ultimately persuaded Jose to go along with this adventure in polyglossia and include all the source texts by reminding him that translations are often published bilingually. Our narrator, I argued, is not claiming to be fluent in seven or more languages. Rather, he is fascinated by language and likes to read books in bilingual editions, his eye often straying to the facing page. In other words, for the narrator too, as for the monolingual anglo anglophone reader, many of the source languages are little more than pictorial illustrations of the foreign. With Jose's permission, I made this explicit in the English version by adding the following phrase in parentheses to a meditation on the unknowable nature of the material world and the closed cycle of cultures that appears under the headword sea sirens. The unfathomable original there on the open page that does not cease to trouble us as we read through its translation. The English version of the encyclopedia came out in January, and I must say that so far, my var the various intentions I've mentioned here to foreground the text Spanishness, heighten its polyglossia, I'm almost done, and um, make its me meditation on translation more explicit have been entirely ignored by <laughs> reviewers and readers. That's why I'm talking about them. <laughs> None of the articles I've read or the readers I've discussed the book with have assessed it in the context of Latin American literature. None have considered what it has to tell us about translation. Only one has even alluded with considerable irritation to the presence of source texts in various languages and scripts. Instead, the novel has been connected to various contemporary discussions of remix culture and the internet. It has been compared to Huisman's A Rebours. Uh, the accuracy of its depiction of Russian life in the 90s has been debated, etc. A translator's intentions, it turns out, are as limited in their ability to dictate the ways a text will ultimately be read as are an author's. That comes as no surprise. I have, however, had one satisfying confirmation of certain of them. The most recent issue of McSweeney's, edited by Adam Thirlwell and published at almost exactly the same time as the English translation of the encyclopedia, is an astonishing literary romp across a poly polyglot universe. Twelve stories are translated by 61 authors into 18 languages, including Chinese, Arabic, Urdu, and Hebrew, all published in their own scripts. I had no idea that this issue of McSweeney's was in the works as I was making my decisions about the encyclopedia, though I do recall defending my notion to include source languages with a line from a book review by Adam Thirlwell in which he spoke of the new possibility of a reckless internationalism in the English language. Now that I do know about this issue of McSweeney's, I'm happy to take it as confirmation of my intentions. In the end, I may decide that I intended it that way. <laughs> Two, so should we take a couple of minutes? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Esther. Nos vemos. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo con lo que vos decís. ¿Leíste? ¿Leyeron ustedes la funambulista historia del profesor Landormí? Landormí, no. Ah, lo llaman Landormí. Landormí todo junto, pero es Landormí. Porque la gente se duerme en sus conferencias. Y está escrita en castellano y francés, pero en un francés que la gente. Y es de los 40. Es divertido. ¿De quién lo escribió? Arturo Cancela. Ah, bueno. Lo voy a mandar. Yeah, well, it's always it's just something you can do. I'm at Uber, so you just got Uber. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can do it as well, so that we can communicate. That would be great. It's really nice to pleasure to meet you. Thank you.
Y esto es Baruch. B-A-R-U-C-H. Es la universidad donde bueno, gracias por haber venido. Tienes que dar clases. Fue un caso conocerte. Y bueno, estamos en contacto. Yo voy a pedirle en español. Ah, bueno, lo que pasa es que no se ha publicado todavía en español. La mayoría de los textos se escribieron en español, pero uh, eh, no, no se ha publicado todavía en español. Están buscando un editor. Él tiene los textos. Sí, sí, sí. sí, sí. Pero no se ha publicado. Sí, es súper interesante. Es un proyecto muy interesante. De Martín, gran filósofo nuestro, que se llama Hombre ante un espejo. Entonces, Martín dice: ¿Qué ve un hombre grande en el espejo? ¿Cómo él se le traduce? No, el Diego es cómo piensa ver el mundo. Por eso hacemos muy las manos gustadas. Y lo que es interesante es ver cómo nos ve el mundo. Para los hijos es muy interesante. Como todos, que por ejemplo, la palabra callar, que es una expresión. A lengua de arte, a lengua bruta, uno que se ve muy mal, clase, es una expresión patriotismo de clase. Hay muchísimos que se llega a ser patriota cuando uno dice que está borracho. El patriotismo de borrachería. Sí, sí. Bien, gracias. Bueno, gracias. Ah, tú me, tú me tu, tu bueno, ya estamos en contacto porque sí, te, te, te había mandado un mail. Si yo te mando algunos cuentos míos en español. No grandes. ¿Puede interesar? Para no, por supuesto que sí. Lo que, te digo que lo que, lo que sumamente me interesa, um, porque después de. Eh, es, es, acabo de editar una antología de textos por traductores sobre la traducción que va a salir en Colombia y que incluye el texto ese de José sobre su traducción del poema de Mandelstam. Y, y, y me, me interesa mucho porque justamente una de las cosas que, que no me gusta con los, los translation studies en inglés es que solo se escribe en inglés so, solo consiste de un corpus de textos que han, se han escrito en inglés como si la traducción no existía fuera del inglés Ah, bueno, y se tradujo al inglés. Pero es, es decir que hay muy poco texto traducido dentro del corpus de lo que se llama el Translation Study. Todo se escribe en inglés, digamos. Y no hay traducciones de, de lo que se escribe sobre la traducción en otros, en otros idiomas. Y me interesa hacer una antología. Y me encantaría tener textos tuyos. Sí, no sé, me, me contó todo eso. De también siempre teníamos contacto con España. Me encantaría leerlo. Y, y fue realmente un gran placer conocerlo. Now we, I don't need to look at that because I was just worried about the kids that day. It's just some people teach it to us, so I wanted them not to feel good. So, I'm a little bit of a shit stop. It's really the most amazing thing.
estamos en el cerro. Sí, pero todavía sí, gracias. Ahora, ¿qué pasa? Sí, sí, sí. The big post-it. Do you want the big post-it? Oh, yeah. I kind of have, well, I have to tell you, I have kind of have a wall in my office where I have, like, a collection of these posters for various, like, because, you know, people when I teach, they just cannot conceive of translation as they can't conceive of it. So it, for someone to walk in my office and see, like, oh, Boston University, yeah, it, it actually is, like, a huge thing. <laughs> it's actually a huge thing for them to go, oh, wow, Distorting English, making English sound weird, so that people can have like the idea. Yeah. And, 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 and it's really funny. Yeah. But then there's always non-English. Yeah. Which is yeah. interesting. And the whole book is about how the French is using a part. <laughs> you know, I, I, I actually think it will be but I'm really glad that you so like, I think that your project is so interesting uh, alongside this. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, and it would be really interesting to have uh, I had this idea for a program called Other Russia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you yeah. like the title. Okay. Yeah, I want the comparison. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, again, we're having some very good unofficial Q&A, but let's go ahead and uh, reconvene the official Q&A. So we have till about 2.50, and um, Jose, I think, has a prepared... No, this is not... This one, no? no, this is That's just... Uh, um, but otherwise, sh questions? Yes. Discussion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, questions? Say, uh, um, you have any questions, please? Are you? The section that you read, Vida Secreta de las Plantas, that you translated as Wander's TV, I'm curious how that was translated into Russian. Um, if that is the same type of. I don't know because it, it hasn't been translated yet. Oh, it hasn't yeah. been translated. This is the first it translation. It hasn't been translated into any language, right? Into this is the, language, the yes, English yes. translation is the yes. first one. So obviously every translator of the book is going to have to figure out completely yes. different solutions to the problems that I address in the to thing about alphabetical yes. order. Uh, the, uh, 
before it was translated, I, I, I for many years I had this preoccupation. I was that I thought that it, it would be it would be impossible to do in a way, you know, to to keep the order of the of the entries and then to have the idea of the novel, the the, the plot and everything. But I did a wonderful. You see, what you you heard the the, the wonderful paper of just I was just lucky that she <laughs> I had this. <laughs> Yeah, because it's a, it's it's a difficult. Uh, I would say it's a difficult. The idea of the book of putting those, on, you know, to keep the alphabetical order. So, so but for any language, I think it would be difficult to find. But this is something that all the translator does, you know. Uh, Did you at any point consider just leaving it in Spanish? The, 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 Well, in the in the handout, I didn't discuss that as much in what I read because there's this handout, which is something that I publish in Translation Review of, about that specific thing. And th there are a couple of precedents for uh, you know alphabetical order translation or, or reordering a text in a translation. And one of them is a novel by David Grossman. Mm. Um, and there, they simply left the head words in Hebrew with a translation, and so it stayed in the same order, but it was the Hebrew order. And, um, well, this book, first of all, I, and, but there all the head words are in Hebrew, right? So but here you have this play of so many different languages. Some of the head words already are in English. Um, and I thought about doing that. In fact, in the version, I actually did do that with some of the entries, with some of the entries that I, I left myself that recourse when I couldn't come up with any other solution. Um, but in, in the version that you have here in this handout, which is an earlier version, I have aldea and then I have village in parentheses. And it felt like it was just too soon in the translation to cop out like that. Like I wanted to, get, I wanted to like. So in the in the final version, it says agriculture, and then in parentheses, as practiced in villages. And indeed, it is it is about agriculture, so it works. You know. So sometimes I would go with a Latinate word. Latin saved me in a lot of cases. Um, or I just would figure out a different way of saying it to keep the alphabetic order. Or with pasarela, at that point, I was I was really more about emphasizing the Spanishness. So I just left the Spanish head word and put catwalk in parentheses. And then you have C under, you know, then well, then when you get to catwalk, it says C under pasarela, and it moves you. So that and which adds a kind of extra dimension to the game of the text of it being an encyclopedia, having these empty headings that then refer to other headings. So that it worked, I think. Anyway, yeah. Um, you mentioned when you were speaking about the, the Spanish that you wanted to include as many as many instances of Spanish as possible, um, and I wonder how you decided how many instances that was, or what was too much, and what where you were kind of maybe losing some comprehension in order to include that, and how you navigate. Well, I mean, I'm very lucky because Jose had written a book in which he was trying to include as much Russian as possible within his Spanish text, and he had done so very deftly throughout the text. So it's a text that already had a certain, you know, rhythm of polyglossia that was part of it. And so, in a, in a sense, you know, it was like trying to, to, to dance with someone, you know, and keep up with their rhythm, right? You just wanted it to be the same, with the same kind of rhythm with which Russian punctuated the text. You're just adding a little bit of a syncopation in there that was also a little bit of Spanish in that rhythm, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it's really almost a musical thing. Um, that, like, there were moments when, you know, he's I think the first moment when I did it kind of explicitly is um, babionki, which is a Russian word that he's introducing. He says, Bab babionki, there are, of course, women, and then I added, or mujeres, as I might prefer to call them, in Moscovy. So he was already doing it between, uh, you know, Sp Spanish and Russian, and so I just interjected within the English, the Spanish that had, you know... <laughs> or yeah. mujercitas, right? As I write. But I just said mujer because, you know, the thing about Spanish is that most people... It, it, you know, mm -hmm. most potential readers of this novel will have had some Spanish. I mean, the United States is very difficult to to graduate from college without having had some exposure to Spanish. So I felt like I could include these very simple vocabulary words without worrying too much about. Um, I kept them simple, so without worrying too much about losing the reader. Um, I have a question about the audience. When you were writing this, what kind of audience did you have in mind? Uh, we had exactly the same question the other night. It's interesting. Yes. It is, you know, I, um, 
This is very interesting. I, I, it's a really I, good I, question. I, yes, because of course, when I was uh, writing the novel, I had I had the idea of uh, of the entries, the idea of those um, explanations is because of the Spanish speaking world that people maybe don't we don't know. I mean, my Cubans uh, readers, I would uh, for the first in the first instance, and then uh, Spanish speakers from, but. Uh, the audience would be, I never, you know, it was 20 years ago, I never, I never dreamed that it was to be translated and everything. So it was just Spanish people from, from, uh, at, 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 and then all the, 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 the Russian writers I quote here, uh, they, 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 I knew them in translation before I went to Russia. So Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, so they were common from the, for the Spanish speakers. Or people from Spain, or from Cuba, or from Mexico, or whatever. So they are very familiar with those. So I was, I didn't put many other, like more com- complex or more local writers or more local, even to to keep this uh, more easier for the readers to to understand. Because you know there are a lot of different older or more local writers. I don't quote here. So the the idea, the, the, the audience I, I had in mind would be, would, uh, I think it was. Uh, the, the Cuban and the, the Spanish speaker. So, did, did you ever yourself have that fear that you were actually like that conversation with Lydia when you um, when she's accusing like why you're trying to penetrate our soul? Like, did you yourself or did you include that because I, I don't know if you ever had that of conversation that you're going to be criticized by Russian? By the Russian no, no, I was criticized many times. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's something that happened when you are in. in, in, in I was in very uh, immersed in the Russian in Russian life. I had a lot of friends, and and there was a conversation. Well, you know, the Russians have this idea of they are unique, right? <laughs> 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 and they, they, they don't, nobody that can comprehend uh, understand them. That the, uh, the, there is a saying in Russian, you know, Russia, Russia only panet. So. <laughs> so uh, I think it's uh, so. If if uh, if, uh, if a foreigner would say we have some opinion about something, we say, "Oh, you don't understand because you don't, you're not Russian. You don't understand anything." So this is something about that, you know, as trying to to put in uh, in the novel like that kind of experience I had, and, and th- this is something that happened. I think it's because also of, because of the Soviet uh, Union, so R- Russia was close to the. F- to f- Foreign um, influence, and but before the revolution, we, uh, in even Moscow, in, in Saint Petersburg, they, they they used to leave a lot of a lot of foreigners, like you know, many or many of them, the um, the noble bra- uh, brothers, the the, the and many others, the chief, uh, you know, different kind of. Uh, so it was more, more cosmopolitan, but for the Russian, it's uh, still it's a uh, it's a. They don't. Uh, many Russians they don't uh, believe that they, they, a foreigner like like, uh, like me will able will be able to speak the language the way I do. For example, that for them it's something like what? It's, it's, <laughs> it's impossible. How how? It, at some point, not to shock people, I, I would say, no, you know, my mother is Russian. <laughs> <laughs> just a just, lie. You just told a lie. Just to just to. <laughs> <laughs> to to calm the, them down a little bit. Yes. <laughs> because otherwise, it's what? Who, who trained you? The KGB? Or <laughs> so that's why, you know, it's, uh, yes, it's a conversation you always will have in there. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Let's, no, you, you already asked me. <laughs> Actually, you were talking about being comfortable with the polyglossy of the text and the translation, partly because of readers are maybe more comfortable than they were say like 20 years ago with um, fragments of foreign languages like that. and I was wondering if beyond that um, sort of globalized culture and access, to easy access to technology and internet do you think it's changed the way people read translations like say, or to understanding um, certain context or references beyond just the fra- reading fragments of the foreign language so, or does it affect the way you translate beyond that? Um, I'm not d- d- change the way that people read translations. Yeah, in other words, say like there's, there's some not only with foreign language, but say some specific political reference that somebody can easily, more easily go oh, and look it up oh, now. Oh, oh, you know, I I couldn't. I think you're making an incredibly uh, an incredibly significant point. Um, I think that the existence of Google has to change the way we translate. Um, it absolutely has to. 
because I mean I remember hearing an interview with the TV producer David Simon who did The Wire and then he did a show about New Orleans called Treme and he said as a writer I will do no exposition I am not going to do any exposition I'm never going to have a character explain to somebody else like let's go over to such and such a restaurant where we've been eating for many years and their speciality is you know or, or whatever you know I mean they could do it much better than that he said if somebody doesn't get it if somebody if a character refers to somebody somebody doesn't know what it is they can google it they can have it in 30 seconds. If they have that question, they can have it answered. If it doesn't matter to them, they won't bother. If it doesn't matter to them, they'll find it out. I don't need to explain. I just don't need to explain. And and I feel like that's really empowering. Um, it's extremely empowering, and it, it makes you able to do things absolutely as a translator mm -hmm. that I don't think you could have done pre-Google. And I, I think we're only at like at the dawn of the changes that that's going to affect in the way we do things. So you would expect readers to have a translation to go. Yeah, I just, I think that people aren't as phased by the unfamiliar because they know that, that you know, 99 chances of 100, they can find out instantly. It's just right there at the touch of their fingers. So, in fact, you know, that, that makes it exciting to read something and be able to go off on this personal exploration, right? Yes, and then when I when I wrote this book, I was I was it was pre the pre Google and everything, and then I was still in Russia, and then I was using you know library and everything. I didn't I didn't keep the all the the the, the, the original the original, yeah. the original um, um, como se fuentes sources sources, sources right sources, yeah. and then but as I find found everything. <laughs> Using yeah, Google thank God for Google. <laughs> 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 it could have taken but, me several years longer to translate this book. So it's um, and it was also very easy in terms of dealing with languages that I don't speak too, because even if you don't speak a language, you have a lot of resources where you can get you can get some idea if you're getting it right or you're not getting it right. Whereas pre Google, pre all of those tools that we now have access to, I would yeah. have been terrified. You know, I would have been just like walking blindly into this alien linguistic space that. I had no knowledge of, and um, but now you can kind, you know. So it it made a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Some other question? Uh, uh, sorry, then you. I was going to ask um, if because you mentioned that a lot of your Spanish speaking readership was familiar with Russian art uh, authors, uh -huh. but you also said that you spent twelve years in Russia. So uh -huh. I was wondering if the book spoke more to your experience or to what you wanted to bring to Spanish speakers conception of Russian authors and whether it's the choice to put the book in an encyclopedia form um, was a reflection of that it's, it's both. I, I think I was I, I had this idea of writing about, but in, in, in the in the first in the first um, places about my life. It, that's it's called Encyclopedia of a Life in Russia. It's not about Russia. It's not about something. It's about my life in Russia. My experience. It's very. It's a very um, um, sub subjective, sub sub subjective, subjective. Uh, Point of view. It's nothing that, uh, of course, any Russian can say that I don't. I don't recognize uh, some such such uh, um, moments of the Russian life or something. But that was my life. There was. I was the, the way I was reading it, and there was a was a, I was reading it um, uh, with the help of the of my previous knowledge of the Russian literature. When I came to Russia for the first time, I I took the long was a long trip, and then the, I um, was traveling from Moscow to Novosibirsk. And then uh, for for me it was I was like it was in a movie seeing all those you know uh, part of Russia and um, in the European part and the Asian part, but I was seeing the the, the country through my uh, through literature to my knowledge to my problem. but yes I want uh, the idea was to 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 make both of those um, to write this is my experience I was you know I was a, I was young many you know twenty years younger than that and and then the, I. I, every time I read the book or reread the something, I found something that I forgot about already. You know, something I was, so it's a kind of diary also, a kind of diary something I was, you know, about my life and my experience, about my, you know, so that's is, that's is. But, you know, you always write, not, it's not a book about, it's not a non-fiction book, it's, it's just a novel. Can I add a footnote to what he said? Uh, one of the things that when this book is translated into Russian, that Russian readers will catch immediately from the title is the allusion to a very famous 19th century Russian critic named Belinsky, who said that Pushkin's Eugene Onegin was an encyclopedia of Russian life. Yes. 
So it's it, it, therefore it, it's kind of, it's kind of within that intertextual context when it is translated into Russian, it'll have that resonance for readers. First of all, I'm exactly the same Russian as yes, I described Russians are unique, no question. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you're his mother. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank both of you. It's uh, because, of course, I'm sorry, but it's in English, not in Russian. But when Margarita sent it uh, to us with excerpts, and I started when I saw Agla in Mishkin, of course, I started with this chapter. And at the, uh, first of all, I was very angry. Where is Aglaya? Where is Mishkin? What, what he's talking about? And when we finished this chapter, I was amazed. It's so enchanting. I don't know. I think, uh, of course, Jose and your translation is so great. I see sky, which, which uh, now it's not so easy to find in even refined Russian books. So it, it's made perfect literature, and I want to thank you for this, Thanks both so of you, really. Of course, still I'm waiting for Russian translation. <laughs> 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 he doesn't want to translate, but I'm still waiting. And another thing, which I want uh, also Margarita sent to us, I already mentioned to her, say, about Mandelstam poetry, and about one uh, specific uh, poem. Of course, many of Russian we knew this very, very well because it was pretty famous uh, during uh, Perestroika time. But I never have read so deep, so serious analysis which I found in Skazer notes. It's, it's probably he is, his mother is Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I started to suspect. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering, and I'm not exactly sure, I guess I'll address both of you. Um, I, I was just wondering about the dynamics of working together as far as like when your book is translated, not necessarily with, with, by Esther, but mm-hmm. by any translator, how much input, especially since you are a translator and you speak the language, how much input do you want to have in that book or do you have in the book, and how... Is it easier to to be translating somebody that who speaks the language and you're able and is able to read what you're doing, or is it better to translate somebody who doesn't speak the language? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think for me, it's, uh, you know, it's always, of course, it's it's very important when you have the the opportunity to read. But I I did the the, the full um, uh, freedom for for the translator to do it, and then after he. She, she she does the she did she does the does the the work. Of course, I have some some question, but I have found that uh, it's always uh, it's a little bit. Of course, I, 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 my, myself I am a translator, so I know how you need to change everything. You want it that will work in the target lang- in the target target language. So it's something I I I don't interfere with that. Um, and then I I always. Her solution is much, much better than something I could imagine, you know, because it's, you know, it's, I, it's, I, um, it's, for me, it's, it's a little bit complicated to, even now, to calibrate if, uh, how, how, how good is written in English or, you know, the, 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 the I can, I can check the facts or something, you know, the factual part of the translation. But the, the the other the most important part that's the style and the style and everything is something that I I free, uh, completely um, bel- uh, um, you know um, um, confi or you know, I'm confident she's she's doing so it's something I I never interfere inter- inter- um, of course I I have found that when the uh, my my translator into German she's also a very good translator. And then she always um, she sent me tons of questions. The most questions the translators ask is the better. Is the translator is, the, is better because she um, she always she I think she find out that it, when she found something, she believes that she understands something. 
I think it's always how you, your your text about the intent, the intention of the author. It's, sometimes it's, it's it's difficult, even for me. You know, you will say, "What do you want to ask to write?" I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. So, so the translation is because it's, it's a more, di- it's, it's a reading in detail, in 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 depth. When you do the translation, as so, something I know, you will know the text best than the author at the end. So sometimes you will find mistakes and that uh, something with also Pavel did with my with, with the translation of into Russian. So he had um, those uh, footnotes at the end of the book. Uh, what, is, what is the book? Oh, here is it. So this is the only edition that has uh, at, pre, uh, at the end of the book, like uh, no. And that's I found it, I found those uh, notes very interesting. So I started the book and with the, with the, all the for the previous one with the previous novel. With all the tra- the question my translator from uh, into French into German they did and with so I started to write a book about about the, my own intentions you know? <laughs> <laughs> trying to plan this is um but this is something you you know when you are a translator I, th- I believe so so. Охвата этим человеком нашего русского пространства. Потому что, потому что это роман. Это роман. Вот роман это иная реальность. Это еще одна реальность. Но она поразительно достоверная. Вот. То, что ты сделал вот с этой книжкой, это как бы филология, это, это, литера... это литер... литература ведения. Но вот есть еще одна книга, которая называется «Между икрой и Ромом». И Ром тоже очень вкусный продукт, но кубинский. Это, наверное, это история и публицистика, да? История и публицистика, да? История Таким образом, иностранцам Россия в последнее время описана в виде художественного произведения, филологии и истории публицистики. Uh, очень интересное дело. Там, например, описывается так называемое дело Эберто Падини. Умберто Падини. В России почти об этом не писали. Uh, это, ну, как бы тень ГУЛАГа русского, mm-hmm. который спроецировался на Кубу. Выбрали писателя одного. So one writer was его, назвали его врагом, врагом кубинского народа. Он вынужден был поначалу, его вроде должны были даже его стрелять, а потом позволили уехать в Америку. Он умер в Майами. Отношения между Кубой и Россией претерпели очень разные моменты. Вот, и объективное описание этого, я еще эту книгу не читал, я только зацепил название этой главы. Но я думаю, он пишет просто объективно, как история. Для нас в России это очень важно, потому что до сих пор в России есть некий такой розовый образ Кубы. Революция с пачангой. Это одна из самых замечательных стран Латинской Америки. Пусть не обижаются в Латинской Америке. Это наиболее интересно, как философия, как мыслители, как революционеры. Одна из самых замечательных стран Латинской Америки. И вот появляется в России кубинец, 
here in Russia appears a Cuban, который, Cuban осмы, guy, который осмысливает реальность российскую. Who gets it about Russian это, для нас, это для нас очень важно. And for us this is very important. Причем он очень хорошо знает историю и философию русской. Он сегодня упомянул об Ахтине, великом философе. And he knows well Russian um, history and philosophy, and today he mentioned it. В этом романе и Набоков. And there's Набоков in this novel. И Мадам Блаватская. Мадам Блаватская. Это принудило меня сделать 150. This forced me. Два. Как называется? One hundred fifty-two footnotes. Комментарий. У нас интересный очень диалог возник. Я хочу проверить это. Считается, что вот публиковать в конце романов такое количество примечаний не способствует, не способствует увеличению читателей. Говорят даже, что иногда при переводе в Америке издатели хотят убрать фразу перевод, что это перевод. Пусть бы американский читатель подумал, что это написано в английском. Вот, я не знаю, правильно ли я сделал эти 150. Я считаю, что правильно. У Бахтина философ нашего замечательного, незамечательное маленькое начало эссе, которое называется «Человек перед зеркалом». Каждый из вас смотрится один раз в зеркало. Так вот, Бахтин говорит, что мы видим в зеркале не себя, не себя, а то, как мир смотрит на нас. Поэтому столько гримас мы смотрим. Вот вы понимаете, вот я заглянул в этот роман как переводчик. Для того, чтобы понять, как мир о нас. Я жил на Кубе. Много раз бывал там. Два года. В 60-е годы мы там снимали кинофильм «I am Cuba». Он здесь продается. Это один из... Сой Куба. Скорсезе сказал, если бы я увидел этот фильм в свое время, я бы был другим. Обязательно купите этот фильм. И мне надо было это переводить. И, конечно, было очень много трудностей. Очень много трудностей. Но это первый, я не знаю, Другие писатели на других языках написали ли столь достоверное описание о наиболее драматичном событии о начале перестройки. Когда в какой-то момент границы перестали существовать. И через границу с Эстонией стали вывозить ракетные установки. Спокойно. Вот он все это описывает. Это было очень неожиданно. Я не совсем согласен. Я в какой статье написал с его взглядом на русскую женщину. Нет, но вы не подумайте, что это неожиданно. Поэтому роман называется Левадия или Ночные бабочки Российской империи. Да, ну, все понимаете, что это от Набокова идет. Вот, я рад, что я знаком с этим человеком. Последний раз мы с ним виделись только что в Москве на Всемирном Конгрессе Переводчиков. Вот, и ты не обязательно пришли вот на испанском языке, как вот этот. Обязательно. Так вот этот. Обязательно, пожалуйста. Спасибо. Мы сейчас готовим в журнале иностранной литературы в Москве целый номер, посвященный Кубе. Марина, конечно, интересно было бы.
Простите, что я так долго говорю, но это от старости. От старчества в Let's hear it for the interpreter. Very skilled. Здесь еще есть две русские девушки. Having heard some of the entries, they sound like self-contained, um, almost like they could be their own poems. Did you write them in order when you were writing the book from A through Z, and did you translate all of them in order? Hmm. I don't think Very so. I don't good question. I, don't I never thought of asking him if he wrote the book in alphabetical order. No, I don't think so. I don't remember. To be honest, that, that's a very good question. I think I... Hmm, I don't remember. <laughs> but... Uh, no, I think I think I have like a, 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 a cloud of different entries, and then I, for many of them, I found the the, the name of the entry to put them in alphabetical order because the alphabetical order is like um it's um it's something that um, um it, this is a novel that and then it's ha something is happening, so I had to put it at the, the beginning and the, the in the middle of the story and the end of the story and move the. But in, inside those side, those parts, they, they, they can, it can be something first and then after that. But uh, for, to, to, to describe the arc of the story, of the, of the plot, of course, I have to put... So for, for many of them, I... And then a friend of mine, uh, at the first version of the, the, of the, la the last when I came to Mexico with, with the manuscript, he... He uh, said uh, it was till the uh, uh, to the, uh, the, la the last the last entry was Yalta. So, and my friend said, "Oh, you have to you have to write something to the with the last word." <laughs> <laughs> so the, I, I, it's a good yes, you're right. <laughs> and then I wrote something. <laughs> so I wrote the last the last. Um, so that you know. was written in alphabetical order. <laughs> so you know, so I have, I I open always for. You know, suggestions and some that kind. Yes. 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 Um, so I, 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 I add at the at the very at the very end at the very end I add that and then I took I took some of the other uh, entries you know so, but this is kind of um, something it's, it's, it's very similar to what Esther did because you you know, you have to rearrange. The order to have this, one. but uh, yeah. So yes. This is a dumb question, but I need to ask it because the way we've been talking about the novel so far, and we're almost out of time, you would think it's an autobiographical encyclopedia of your life in Russia, which anybody who has read it knows. Um, it's about some guy who calls himself Thelonious Monk, <laughs> <laughs> turns some amateur musician named Nastya into Linda Evangelista, whom I confess I had to use Google to look up. Um, <laughs> it's a, this is a translation project of the most radical order. That's true. To begin with. <laughs> um, That's true. <laughs> I, I want to talk about how that central fact of the novel, it's non-autobiographicalness, its playfulness, and its centeredness on this um, translation project changes between your work and yours. No, th yes, the idea of, 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 of giving them different names is, yes, is because also to, to um, emphasize the idea of the Western influence of the, you know, of the Linda Evangelista was a very famous supermodel at the time, and Dylan's Monk is uh, something that I I choose because of the, of the sonority of the of the name and uh, Telonius, yes. And um, but. Uh, but did you know about him? Oh yeah, of course. Oh. Yes, yeah. Because yes, uh, from my, from my childhood in Cuba, uh -huh. my father was a very uh, fan of jazz music. Yes, yes. music. So, um, um, but that's that's something that they have. They I real yes, I put them a mask to 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 act in that in that kind of. Uh, play in the play they are playing in my in my novel, and uh, it's a, it's kind of translation. That's true. That's true of uh, something that from the from the West, how it will work in the in the Soviet in the in that in, the, in that moment the Soviet Union. No? But um, it's just it just I don't know it's just um, I don't know. 
I, I'd say that there's one moment in the novel where I felt like I could really enter. I mean, there is this play of masks. There are some moments in the novel where you think, okay, this really happened. You know, there are some emotional moments. And there are other moments where, I mean, the, the plot of the novel, such as it is, is that somebody is hiring a musician to perform a role in a novel, as if it was like a filmmaker hiring an actress, except it's a novelist hiring someone to be, to pose as the main character of his novel. And I think it's quite brilliant that Jose noticed that these two very popular things in the West, in just at the moment of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the greatest perfume is called opium, you know, the opiate of the people and all of that. And then that the supermodel was her last name having to be Evangelista. So there she is, evangelizing for capitalism, right? Um, so I, those names are brilliant. Um, and and monk. they also very, and, and monk, right? The, 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 there's a great description just of the sonorities of the name uh, uh, Thelonious Monk, and that the, the the last name is like the thwack of the tail of a Nordic mammal on the water. You know, <laughs> it's like such a great description of it. But I loved this sort of this this play of masks. The novel is all about this play of masks, and every once in a while, you think you catch a glimpse of something that's sincere or something that really happened behind the mask. But a lot of it is really. Um, a, a, a game, a literary game. You know, there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes on here. And there was one moment when I was able to enter into that game a little bit because um, uh, that Pavel disagrees with um, Jose's view of the Russian woman. And as a yeah, woman, exactly. obviously, there's a lot of imagery of the female in this book that I'm sort of like, well, gee, I just don't see women that way. You know, I, I have a different image of women as a woman. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so there is this one incredible moment that I want to draw to your attention to where the technique that I've been talking about um, it's in the in the part that mentions the Turing test. Where is that? What page is that? Mm. Um, where um, is it? Summa Technologiae. Um, anyway, there's a moment where a passage from the Turing test, uh, or, or a description of the Turing test, that is presented as a citation from Alan Turing's description. Uh, Alan Turing's very famous article in which he proposes the Turing test appears. And so I went and looked, I Googled it, <laughs> and I went and looked at the actual article for the Turing test, and I discovered that what was purporting to be a citation was actually an adaptation, because the actual test that Turing proposes is a test to determine whether somebody is male or female. Um, the game is that two people are behind closed doors, uh, one is male and one is female, and there's somebody in the middle who's sort of reading uh, and and trying to figure out which is the man and which is the woman, and it's a sort of like a party game of of, of the period. And Turing then proposes that that game could be used with a machine to determine, you know, the the degree of um, of artificial intelligence that the machine had reached um, in order to uh, mimic the human. Um, if you had something behind closed doors and you didn't know if it was a machine or a human. But in the original article, that is that test is actually described as a test of trying to establish male or female. So here my, my, my um, use of the source text and the, uh, you know, my idea of translation, this was a kind of translation, that he, uh, an adaptation of the text. So that passage actually appears twice. I wish I could find it now. I just Vanilla added. Ice, um, which, which, which? Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice. Okay. It's under, of course it's under Vanilla Ice. Alan Turing <laughs> is under Vanilla Ice because that's just the kind of book this is. <laughs> um, yes, it's on page 162 and 163. Um, so the actual passage from the Turing uh, uh, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, the famous essay, appears in uh, italics, and then the translation of it, the kind of adaptation of it so that it doesn't d deal with gender, but deals with the machine and the human, which is how it appeared in Jose's book, um, appears after that. So you get it twice. You get it in the the received idea of the Turing test, which is it's how to distinguish machine from human, and you get it as it actually appears in Turing's <laughs> article, which is how to distinguish male from female. And that was my way of sort of interjecting this notion of um, some difference of, uh, some difference of opinion regarding gender <laughs> into, into the book. So I could enter into the play of the book and, and add that by the logic that I had set out for my translation, and it just ended up in, including me in the game somehow, or my perspective. Si, alguna otra pregunta, some other questions? Please. Hmm? I have time for maybe one more question. Well, I, I, I was like, 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 I
Well, um, a part of that, well, well the sonority was uh, something that I used when, when I was uh, debating between transliteration or using the Cyrillic scripts, because for someone who doesn't speak Cyrillic, the Cyrillic script has no sound value, whereas the transliteration does. So that was really a difference in sonority. So where something had a sound value um, w would, would somehow be sonorous, uh, for a reader, even who didn't understand, I tried to. I, I did use transliteration um, to incorporate that sound value. And then at other moments, when I thought this would have no sound value and it functions better just as a visual image of the foreign for the person who doesn't understand it, I used the Cyrillic. So that was really. It was in deciding between those two options that sound really came into play. And substitution, I think you said about uh, uh, the. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it was obviously the flow with which I could incorporate, the, the rhythm of incorporating the Spanish in with the rest of it, and where it made logical sense, and where it sounded okay, where you could read it, and it would flow. Hay muchas connotaciones con esa palabra. Muchas críticas. Connotations. Con cariño, a veces se dice. Endearment, and uh, perhaps... Do you play music? Do I play music? Um, not too much. No, <laughs> I listen to music. All right. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank all of you. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. You've asked wonderful questions.